Welcome, everybody. Great to have you with us. Chris Stewart, once again, filling in for Eli Gold on Hey Coach. Head Coach Nick Saban joining us in just a moment. We welcome back in our media guest for the evening, not only from the SEC Network and ESPN, but from his own radio show on Jocks FM every morning and other stations around the state of Alabama. Co-host along with Greg McElroy, Cole Kublick, again, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Greg uh, is the co-host, by the way. Greg is I, the co-host. I'm, I'm going to claim host. I, I'm fine with that. Okay. I'm fine with that because it starts with the center before it gets to the quarterback. There you go. Absolutely. That's what I try to do. Just give him the shotgun snaps and let him let him ramble. How's He's he smarter hit? than I am. You said ramble, not scramble, right? He, he did that scramble. a couple of no. times. No, he did a couple of times. They were pretty good. He's mentioned that run against Florida in the SEC championship game at least 35 times since we've been doing the show. He's awful proud of that I'm one run. I'm guessing he's that means he's said that 70 times and you only paid attention to 35. Very fair. Uh, Very fair. We still appreciate the fact that he did it. How it's stupid to ask you, but I'm going to anyway. How enjoyable is it for you to be able to talk about something you love so much on a daily basis? It, I tell people I haven't worked in probably seven years. I really don't feel that way. It, because even the part that goes into it, the process, as Coach would say, is enjoyable to me. I, if I didn't have three kids under eight, I would watch eight, 10, 12, 15 hours of film a day, looking up statistics, seeing what different guys were doing, all of that, talking to different people about their teams. I enjoy all of it. It never feels like work to me. As glad as we are to have you here, you do understand the applause wasn't for either one of us. It's for the gentleman that just put the headset on. Coach Saban, good to see you, sir. Good to be here. How y'all doing? Doing great. great how was job. your week? Good. We're trying to get better. You know how that goes. I understand. Yeah. So, you know, we did some good things in the last game. I think we made a lot of explosive plays. Um, they didn't get any explosive plays, which is really unusual, which is a credit to the defense. Special teams did a really good job and setting a record for punt returns and blocking a kick and scoring and scored on defense. So we had more players play to the standard. Even when the second guys got in the game, you know, they played, um, you know, better, you know, I thought in, in the second half. So, you know, that was a good thing. Hopefully we got more and more guys getting into to where they – um, I, I think that, you know, some plot some time, sometimes players lose sight of where are we? What are we doing here? You know, why are we here is one of the questions that I ask them sometimes. And I ask them that, that this week because, you know, players basically get judged by how they play. And I think sometimes players lose sight of that. You know, they get so, like, engulfed in the, the grind of practicing every day and meetings every day. And, you know, they, they start to just, you know, sort of endure the grind rather than focusing on the things that they need to do that are really going to help them improve and get better because they're going to get judged on how they play. We get judged as a team on how we play as a team. And we're getting judged compared to the best teams in the country. So, um, you know, everybody's got to really be able to stay focused on improvement. You know, learning lessons, being responsible for the choices and decisions you make, being willing to correct those things so that you can improve. You know, what you did yesterday, you can improve on today so that you can shine tomorrow. You know, those things are, I think, really, really important, especially as you go through the SEC, you want to improve and stack positive performance, and that's what we're trying to focus on. Coach, is there, is there a part of you, because what I heard a little bit of that is that players can get tunnel vision very easily, and I think it, that sometimes can be position specific where a guard won't know what the center's responsibility is. One receiver just knows what his single route is on that play. Do you try to spend a lot of time to help the guys learn conceptual football? Offensive guys know the entire play, not just their individual position. I actually went down and watched the secondary to see you operate a little bit. You poked some fun at me for never going and watching the offensive line. I wanted to see how you worked that. <laughs> Is that a big part of how you want your guys to learn football? Well, I think if, if players can understand concepts, which means they have to understand the big picture, then their adaptation ability to adjust because they understand the big picture, especially like if you're playing on defense or you're playing in the secondary or linebacker, you've got to adjust to a lot of different formations, sure. a lot of different motions. So, you know, that becomes very, very challenging. The guys that struggle to me are the guys who try to memorize what they do. They just try to memorize what they do. And uh, I think that it's important to know what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, why it's important to do it that way. 
Uh, and it's important to have, you know, intentional focus. You know, I think sometimes people focus on things, but they focus on all the wrong things. You know, there's a lot of things out there that you can't really do anything about, but you can control what you can control if you focus on the right stuff. So it's kind of like intentional, you know, in terms of what I'm focusing on. But understanding the big picture and the concepts, you know, to me, those are the kind of guys that play the best for us. Um, but at the same time, you know, if there was something that I would criticize, it's attention to detail. You know, whether you're supposed to push crack on a play if you're playing receiver, whether you're supposed to run a route at eight yards instead of six yards, wh whatever it might be, whatever your job is, what your steps is to, to make a B block as an offensive lineman, whatever it is, you've got to be able to focus on those things and do those things correctly. But if you understand the big picture of what the defense is doing, where the linebackers are moving to, you can do those things a lot better. I'd love for you to take me, because this will help me as well, and I think it'll help a lot of fans because I hear a lot of the complaints about defensive backs, corners, when the ball's in the air. Why did he touch him? Why, why didn't he knock the ball down? Could you take us through some of the coaching points, let's say in a one-on-one -on -one situation, balls thrown down the field? Because it, it feels like it leans so much more towards the offense, has so many things that can go their way, and there's very few things that can go the defender's way. How, right. how do you coach a guy down the field in a one-on-one -on -one situation and, and I think we can all kind of learn from just how you attack that with your players every day. Yeah, well, I think that everybody wants to say, play the ball. That, that's what everybody thinks, that when the ball gets thrown up, the defensive player should play the ball. And I agree with that. All right, but there's a concept in, that has sort of grown through football. And it started because people started playing a lot of close coverage, which is what we do bump and run, whatever you want to call it. All right, so if you have the receiver cut off, they throw what they call the back shoulder throw. All right, so I'm running down the field, and if I look over my inside shoulder, like we all grew up learning how to play the ball, the quarterback throws it to the receiver's back shoulder, and he turns around and catches it over here, and by the, when you look over here, by the time you look back, it's too late. Sure. So we have to coach the guys, and we put a cone out every day. All right, what is the break point for their receivers? In other words, they're going to run 14-yard comebacks, then the 14-yard is the break point. 18-yard comebacks, 18 yards is the break point. All right, so we put a cone there, and we make our guys play the long ball, and they got to play the receiver till they get to the cone. Okay. If the, if the receiver hasn't turned his upfield shoulder back by then, it's not a back shoulder throw. You turn and look for the ball. If you're in position – and you have the receiver cut off, which means I'm high shoulder position on him. In other words, my shoulder's in front of his shoulder. That's perfect position. So then I turn and look for the ball. But I, have to, I can't look for the ball until I get through the move area because what if I look for it at 14 yards and he makes an 18-yard comeback? So uh, if you're not in phase, I, which I call in phase as I'm on the upfield shoulder with the guy, I can feel his thigh. Right. I can actually cheat and slow him down a little bit if I want to use that. But um, if I'm out of phase, which means I'm not in high shoulder position, my shoulder's behind his shoulder, I, then I have to play his eyes and hands to the ball. He can't catch the ball unless he drops his eyes to his hands. So when he's looking up, he puts his hands up. When his eyes go down, I want to swat the ball. i got to practice that. Now, if I'm out of phase and I run into phase, I have to play the ball through the receiver because the same thing will happen. I run in back into phase. I look this way. He'll catch the ball right when I look. All right, so that's what we try to coach. Now, the bad thing about what people do now, the big thing is don't run an outside fade put a guy in a slot and run what we call chop route, which he's running an inside fade. So he has more horizontal position outside. You have to be in vertical position on a receiver, which means I got you cut off. But you also have to be in horizontal position because if they can throw the ball away from you, you may have the guy cut off, but they can throw the ball outside of you and the guy can adjust to the ball and you can't play the ball. So you have to play the ball through the receiver. And that means I got to look for the ball through the receiver. Well, there's so much pass interference called, mm -hmm. right? Because when you do that, the officials think you're not playing the ball, but you are playing the ball. Because if you look over the inside shoulder and there's 10 yards of grass outside of you and the quarterback uses the grass to throw the ball, the receiver is going to adjust to the ball and you can't play it. 
So, um, I don't know if I'm getting too technical here or not. Actually, I was hoping is, you would. Is there going to be a test? To go. That's what I want to know. Is there an exam at the end but, of But, I mean, everybody here understands what vertical and horizontal is, right? I mean, you, you get that part. We'll get them back. You understand in phase and out of phase, right? I'm either got the guy cut off or I don't. But phase is something you hear a lot of. I've heard Coach Muschamp talk about it. T-Rob, who's your secondary coach now, I've heard him talk about it for a long time. And that's something that I think a lot of us that don't know that position very well, we don't, we don't understand that part of it. All that he just said, by the way, while you're running a 4-3-40 down the field and another guy's right there next to you in a live game with a helmet and shoulder pads on. So it's, it even sounds easier when you describe it in a very lengthy way than it actually is taking place. Do you ever adjust any of your coaching points based on the type of receivers that you're going to see? So you'll have one big physical receiver this week. Are there different things you'll do in practice for, say, a 6-4, 6-5 guy that you have a pretty good idea? They're going to throw him some jump balls in this game. Right. Well, I, and I think that, you know, first of all, if guys are bigger and maybe they're not quite as fast, then they're going to be very proficient at the back shoulder because they struggle to get on top of people. So if they can't get on top of people and you have them cut off, where they're going to throw the ball, back shoulder. Mm -hmm. And their size helps them play that ball. And they're playing against a smaller guy most of the time. So you have to adapt how you play. How does a guy release? You know, if a guy releases at the line of scrimmage and he's a big guy and he uses his hands well, you don't really want to give him your hands because it's like karate. You know, you're giving a guy a source to attack, so now he grabs you and pulls you and he gets off the line of scrimmage. So, yeah, there are different techniques that you coach and teach these guys. But I love it. I love it. I mean, I, there's a lot going on in the secondary. I know you were an offensive lineman, and, you know, you know you, everybody that you have to block is within two feet of you. That's not how it is in the secondary. <laughs> Dude, he's going to get a shot. Here. I used to love when the secondary guys would try to blitz, and then I get to come out there and just punish them. Yeah, well, that was I, my favorite. Yeah, I would think so. You know, 180-pound guy <laughs> running through the A-gap, you ought to be able to <laughs> slobber knock them pretty good. Still got to catch them. You got to catch them. We got to catch Pee Wee down in Grand Bay, Coach. We remind everybody that the uh, first question is brought to you by Alabama 811. Always contact 811 before you dig to know what's below. Call 811 or visit AL811.com. Pee Wee, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Chris. Coach, how are you doing, sir? Doing good. How you doing, Pee Wee? I'm doing well. Uh, Coach, uh, you had made some changes during the game last week uh, to, uh, to be a little bit more physical on the offensive line. I was just wondering how has that progressed during the week? Have the guys kind of embraced that, and have they been playing a little bit more physical this week? Well, I think that's you make an important point, and I think that's one been one of our point of emphasis with the offensive line is I, I think that the inside three guys, when you play in this day and age of football, there's a lot of zone blocking. So if those guys cannot get movement on the two eye and the three technique and at least move them, you know, it, it, it it does, you, they can cut the gaps on defense all right, where it doesn't give the runner a lot of options. All right? But if your down guys can move those guys, especially the inside guys, the center and two guards, you know, when you're running the ball to the perimeter, the tackle block becomes much more important. And, you know, that's the thing that we've been trying to uh, do a better job of is being a little bit more physical inside. Uh, and, you know, some of it's personnel, uh, which we got a lot of competition there, so guys are trying to play more, more physical. And um, I, I think that some of the younger players that we have are more physical, and maybe they can help us down the road as well. Coach, one of my favorite messages that I've heard you attempt to deliver to the media and then maybe some fans when they've asked you about it is some inability to run the ball consistently the last few years. And you've kind of gone back to a very similar message multiple times, and that is you guys get all excited when we throw the ball around, when we throw for 400 yards and the receivers go for 80 yards. And then you want us to be able to just go four-minute offense and push people around. But if you don't rep that, if you don't practice that, you can't just turn into that. How right. difficult is that balance either through practice or the course of a season to try to have both of that with an offensive line or just an offense in general? Well, I think always what we've tried to do offensively is play to our strengths. And we've had some really good quarterbacks here of the last several quarterbacks plus the one we have right now. And we, we play a little bit better when we're spread out. You know, and the defense has to declare itself when you're spread out a little bit more than when you have people all bunched up. Yes, sir. So um, that creates a lot of pressure on the offensive line 
if you do pass the ball to pass block and be good pass blockers. And it's really hard to have guys that are really good pass blockers and then have them be able to just be physical and overpowering, you know, in the run game at the same time. Now, when you have guys like that, you know, you have special people. And we have some guys like that, but we became a little bit more of a finesse team around some of the quarterbacks that we have, which is not really the style that we'd like to play. So we want to get back to having great balance and being able to do both things equally well. And that's been the challenge of what we've tried to do to get the running game going and be more physical up front. Sometimes I think, though, you know, we got to be a little more diverse in how we try to run the ball. You know, you can't just run zone plays all the time. you got to do some other things where you, you know, gap block and pin and pull and do some things that, you know, at least you're, you're making the defender do something besides play the guy in front of them. Cole Kublik is our media guest tonight here on the Nick Saban Show. We want you to give us a call on the Yellowhammer Brewing Hotline, 877-202-BAMBA. We'll get to those calls next here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. They'll try to hit the man out of the backfield. It goes off his head. Will Anderson, interception, 10-5, touchdown, Alabama. And refreshing Bama highlight presented by the refreshing Yellowhammer Brewing Company, brewed locally in Alabama and served to fans across the Southeast. I'm Chris Stewart. Cole Kublik is our media guest from the SEC Network, alongside, of course, Coach Nick Saban. And, Coach, the uh, first question of the night from AL.com. The thread there is from Curtis in Franklin, Tennessee. And Curtis asks, uh, Coach, Vanderbilt's receiver is currently leading the SEC, and their running back is ranked second in rushing. What makes them such a good offensive team? And, of course, Curtis says roll tide. Yeah, well, they do have uh, number 14, as the fans will see, uh, is a really good player. He's a good size guy. He's got good quickness. He's got good speed. He's got really good hands. He's great playing the ball in the air, really good on the back shoulder that we talked about before. Uh, they put him in some spots, you know, so that they can utilize his talents, and they do a very good job of that. Uh, number two is a, a, the running back is, you know, kind of a, you know, bowling ball kind of 5'9", built low to the ground, thick guy that uh, has a lot of power. He's got good quickness. Um, he's got good contact balance. In other words, you know, people hit him and bounce off of him, and he keeps going, and um, and they got a really good scheme offensively in terms of what they do. It's a little different. You know, there's a little some option elements, you know, to it, uh, which a lot of people aren't used to playing option right now. And um, they've got a, you know, really good passing game that goes with some of these option plays. And uh, so they've utilized their personnel really, really well. And I think their players are playing with a lot more confidence uh, this year than maybe, you know, a year ago. Uh, you watch the same – Guys play, they have 14 starters back, seven on both sides of the ball, so they got some veteran players. Um, so this is a much better Vanderbilt team than, you know, some people probably think. Coach, when you get a year under your belt, I don't care where you are, it does make a world of difference, doesn't it, like Clark Lee does now? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it um, you know, I, 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 like, pull my hair out, literally, when I don't have much left, which is a problem, but... Uh, young players, things that you just went over in the meeting that you just walked through, and you put them in the same situation, all right, and they don't get it right. And it's like, and you, you know, you just wonder to yourself, how could I teach this better? You know, how could we have a better teaching progression that this player would learn it and know it? And the older players, can grasp those things and those details much more easily. It's experience, it's confidence, it's recognition, uh, all those things. So uh, when you have experienced players, I think that's really, really important. And um, I think I talked about this last week, and that's one of the things that has been a little bit different dynamic. You know, nobody ever really knows for sure, you know, how like the transfer portal is going to affect your team. All right, so the transfer portal has really been good for us because we get somebody else's best players. And we got four or five really good players this year. But a lot of those middle guys that left the team, our team, because they were older players who were experienced, but they were backup players and they didn't seem 
the, the, the light in terms of they would be able to be starters. So they wanted to go someplace where they could start. Well, those were experienced players that were in backup positions. Those were experienced players that were playing on special teams. So now you're taking younger players and they're moving up into those slots with less experience. So that's how that's kind of impacted our team. And we have some really good young players and some really good freshmen, but it's a work in progress in terms of their development and them being able to develop the confidence to do the things the way you need to get them done. Coach, let's go to the phones. JB is up in Haleyville on the Yellowhammer Brewing Hotline. Hello, JB. Hello, Chris. Coach, how are you doing tonight? Good, JB. How are you? Fine, sir. Listen, I'm going to tell you what, you've got a good one sitting there next to you and Cole Kubelik. I listen to him every day, and he's an Auburn guy, but I tell you, he calls it pretty much like he sees it. Uh, I just want to ask both of you, but what position group, and this may be a crazy question, can improve the most throughout the year, offensive, defense, special teams, what position group do you think can most improvement during the course of the season? Roll tie, Coach. I don't know if he's specifically referencing this team, Coach, or if he just means in general. He asked, what position group do you believe can improve the most across the course of a season? Well, I think it's a challenge for everybody to focus on their improvement. Uh, there's no question about the fact that everybody wants to eliminate bad plays. So, you know, how do you do that? You know, first of all, you've got to have your head in the right place. So you've got to be committed to – you, have, you have, your, have, have to have your heart in the right place and be committed to doing the things you need to do to make the corrections that you need to make. So when you make bad choices and decisions, the first thing you got to do is own up to them. Right? If you own up to them, you got a chance to take responsibility for them and take ownership for them so you can improve and continue to make progress and eliminate bad plays so you can stack positive performance. I don't think there's any group on our team that I don't have an expectation that we're trying to get them to improve. Um, specific positions, specific players. I don't think we have any perfect players on our team, so everybody's got some room to improve. I mean, I think one of the things Kobe Bryant said when, when you know, he was here and talked to the team, which you know, kind of resonated with me, is he said, you know, I know I can't be perfect, but I'm going to close the gap on perfect as much as I can which means I'm always working to get better. I'm always trying to be better than I was the day before. And he was very committed to that, and that's probably what made him a great player. And I think most great players are committed that way. You know, they're never satisfied. Uh, they, they don't get complacent about what they did yesterday and how well they did it. They don't let things like what they say about them in the media or who they're playing and all those things affect how they play because they're – motivated from inside out in terms of them wanting to be the best players. And they're focusing on that every day. So they're looking always, you know, to make these improvements because they got their head in the right place. They got their heart in the right place in terms of what they want to accomplish and what they want to do. And then they put their feet in the right place to go put it in action. So they got a chance to get better. So when they get to the game, right, they can have positive performance because it kind of goes to what I said before. You know, everybody's being judged on how they play. And I even said it, I think, a week ago. You know, sometimes when you win, you can lose. All right, we went and won a game and went from first to second. Because we got judged against the best teams. All right, so were we one of the best teams in the way we played? Whether we won or lost, didn't matter. The other team lost, they got in the top 25 by losing. So it really is about how you play all the time and how you perform and how you can play with consistency. And that's the challenge, is guys taking ownership to play with consistency. That means you gotta practice every day because you gotta create the right habits and practice to be able to take them to the game. Coach, I wanted to ask you about improvement and actually it goes along with what the caller said, in season improvement specifically. You run one of the more physical camps of anyone in college football, at least that I've been around before a season begins, but we've been so limited with the amount of contact that we can have these days, spring football and in fall practice. How much do you look at where guys are when the season begins as opposed to one, two, three, four games in and being able to still make that drastic improvement because you can't do as much in fall camp as normally what you did before? I don't want to say that you practice in a game, but it almost feels like the first couple of games are just an extension of fall practice because you might not know 
what your guys are all about until they get into that setting? Well, I, I think what we're doing right now in college football, I still think that we're doing enough I, that we can actually develop players fundamentally in terms of what they need to do. The number of practices and pads that we have, uh, the number of practices and shells that we have, and the number of practices that we have, shells being shoulder pads, and the number we have to just go in spider pads, which is basically just a helmet, which is no contact days. I still think we can develop players that way. I think football is a contact game, and I think that if we minimize it much more than this, then you know you sort of go over the pendulum swings the other way in player safety, because if you haven't done enough of that conditioning to play the game physically, then more guys get hurt when they do play because they're not used to the physical contact and they're not used to uh, having their body you know, accustomed to the things that they have to do when they do play the game and it speeds up and it's fast and people are you know, making a lot of contact hits. So um, I think we're okay where we're at right now. But I do think the way we practice is geared toward continuing to improve throughout the season. I know a lot of people worried a lot about you know, keeping the players healthy. And, you know, I've never coached football being afraid of guys getting hurt. I don't think football is a dangerous game. I think if you practice the right way, you stay on your feet, you can play fast, you can play with contact, uh, you don't take people down to the ground. Most people that we ever get hurt in practice are on the ground. You know, somebody falls on somebody's leg, somebody falls on somebody's ankle. So if you can keep your feet, and that's why when we practice against each other, we always practice good on good. It's always ones against ones, all right, because they're the guys that are most experienced. They're the guys that have the best balance and body control. So we actually get less guys hurt. You would say, well, why don't you practice those guys against lesser guys? Well, the lesser guys are the guys that are falling on the ground. All right, so um, – but I do think that you have to practice in a way during the season that your team makes improvement. And that's something that, you know, we really, really, you know, pride ourselves in trying to do and being able to do because in this league, you got to improve. If you look at who we got to play, now, you know, this week and every, every week that we play, your team always has to improve. Coach, we're going to get a question from the audience. First, though, we need to sneak in this quick break on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. First punt, traveled 40 yards, pressure up the middle, it's blocked. Ball down at the five, Bama trying to pick it up, they do, and they will score. Malachi Moore, touchdown Alabama. Defense and now special teams getting touchdowns in this one as the Tide adds to its lead. Welcome back to the Nick Saban Show, live from Baumhauer's Victory Grill here in Tuscaloosa. I'm Chris Stewart filling in for Eli Cole Kublik is our media guest from the SEC Network, Coach Nick Saban, joining us, of course, here on stage. And we're going to go to a gentleman who's been very kind to be so patient with us to ask a question to you, Coach. Go ahead, sir. All right. How you doing, Coach? How you doing? I'm Terrence. And my question is, uh, with us playing uh, Vandy this weekend, with them having a dual-threat quarterback, understanding that we have dual-threat quarterbacks on our team, have, uh, have you seen, where, seen the success being – where the linebacking core spies on that quarterback, or we uh, bleed the uh, our secondary to co pull up and, uh, and assist the linebacking core. Right. I think, you know, the question is uh, when you play an athletic quarterback, you know, how do you manage, you know, the guy? And uh, I think that, you know, we get a lot of practice because Jalen Milrow is one of those guys on our team. So when we practice against each other, I mean, even in two-minute today, when we do two-minute against each other, um, if you don't mirror him, spy him, do something, if you got him all covered down the field, he's going to take off running. All right, so you have to have a plan to do that. Now, that's in a passing game. And, you know, most everybody spreads you out some kind of way, and they have these draw stick options where they can throw a pass or run it, so you got to keep the box right. And that puts a little more stress on the coverage. All right, but if you put people out there and cover them, then the guy's going to run a quarterback draw. Right, so those are challenges when you have an athletic quarterback. So and in the running game, because he has the capability of pulling the ball, uh, you have to have the defensive ends, and the defense has to be in total coordination, just like old option football, who has the dive, who has the quarterback, 
And then by motion and formation, they will create a pitch man sometimes. So who's got the pitch and how are you going to take the pitch? All right, so those are some of the um, challenges that, you know, Vanderbilt personnel-wise as well as scheme-wise, you know, presents, you know, to us. But I think when you play against teams like this, all 11 guys on defense, you have to use all 11 of your guys to do the right thing to – have the guy on the dive, the quarterback, the pitch, and there's run pass options involved in this too. So somebody's got to play run pass. So, um, you know, it's challenging, and their guy's really good at it. So it's going to be a challenge for us. Coach, our second question from the Nick Saban Show thread at AL.com is from Kelly and Eufaula. Kelly says, hey, Coach, I've always been curious what skills and size make for a better safety than a corner on defense. Thank you, and roll tide. Oh, well, you know, I think, first of all, you have to say what makes a good defensive back. Uh, I think there's three critical factors that every defensive back at every position has to have. First of all, you've got to be able to play the ball in a deep part of the field, which everybody sees when a guy can't play the ball in a deep part of the field. It's a problem because even if you got the guy covered, he still catches the ball and you're giving up a big play. Second thing is you got to be able to tackle because you're the last line of the fence. So when you miss a tackle, the guy may run for a touchdown. If the linebacker misses it, the safety may tackle the guy for a seven-yard gain. And you got to be able to play man-to-man. If you can't eventually at some point in time deny the other team the ball by playing man-to-man, you can't get off the field on third down, and, you know, you're going to give up a lot of easy throws you know, uncontested type, I call them gifts. You know, they're gifts. You know, you're playing off the guy. If they just throw a five-yard hitch, it's a gift. So you got to be able to play man-to-man. So the difference between a corner and, and a, a safety, a safety has to be bigger, more physical guy because he's going to fit the runs a lot more than the corners will have to. The corners have to do a better job of being able to cover people because they may not get challenged in the game nearly as much as a safety, but the plays they get challenged on in the game will be potential explosive plays because it may be a long pass, it may be a takeoff, it may be a chop route, whatever, but the ball's going down the field and they have to, and they got to play 70 plays in the game so that they're in the right position on those five plays. But the safeties are involved in just about every play, so they have to be bigger, more physical, because they have to tackle the runners. And your design on offense sometimes is we want to block everybody we can and make the corner make the tackle. You hear a lot of offensive coaches say that because the corners are probably not as physical as the safeties, but they're better cover guys because they're quicker, they're faster, they got better feet and change of direction. Now, in this day and age of football, when people spread you out, you have to have what I call cover safeties. If your safeties can't cover, then people are going to expose them because they're going to put their receivers in a place where your safety has to cover them. And if they can't cover, you're going to get beat on some of these routes that I'm talking about. So uh, those are the basic critical factors to play DB and the biggest difference between corners and safeties. Coach, one of the the biggest takeaways I had from you when we met with you for the opener in the Utah State game, you were talking about some of your defensive backs and You mentioned assignment football, knowing what to do, and I think your quote was that you can't play to your full potential if you don't know your assignment, meaning you're not going to go full speed because you're going to be thinking too much. But you also said something that I haven't heard a lot of guys say, and that is corners are going to get beat. Even if you know what you're doing, even if you're in phase, it's going to happen. I'm interested in how do you talk to your guys about that aspect of their game? If it's going to happen at some point in time, how do you calm them down? Or how do you talk to them about the fact that you just gave up a 50-yard pass, be able to bounce back, come back, and play the next play? Well, I basically tell them all that, look, guys, there's nobody that's ever played this position that hadn't gotten beat. Everybody gets beat playing the secondary. The best guys just get beat the the lesser amount. Sure. All right, so, but the critical factor is how are you going to play the next play? Right? You can't get affected at any position in any sport on what happened on the last play. You can't do anything about the last play. All you can do is learn what you did wrong and try to do it better on the next play. By getting frustrated about it and not, like, I won't let our guys hand clap. You know what I mean by hand? Everybody know what I mean by hand clap? 
guy messes up and goes like that, like, oh, man, I messed up. You're telling the other team you messed up. So how's that helping you play better? I will not let our defensive backs cannot hand clap. Did you see anybody hand clap today? No, uh, no, I no, no. I actually went and watched them today. You, you want to get your butt chewed out. That's a good way to do it is the hand clap and like I messed up. Oh, you're admitting it. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, you're not telling the other team, you know, I messed up. So how's that helping you play better? So, but the number one thing defensive backs have got to be able to do, they got to have resiliency so they can play the next play. I don't care if they miss a tackle. I don't care if they get beat. I don't care if they give a pass. All right, what can I do better on the next play so that I'm not going to, because the multiples of bad plays are what make the good players and the bad players, and how consistently can you play. But you will get beat at some point in time, the best players that play, and you got to be able to play the next play. I mastered that because I got beat a lot, so I knew. Exactly, how to manage that. I just realized that the only time he's looked at me all night was when he talked about somebody messing up. That was the part that I, <laughs> that I took from it. This segment of the Nick Saban Show is brought to you by Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. With zero sugar and refreshingly delicious, is Coca-Cola Zero Sugar the best Coke ever? Find out for yourself. We're back to finish up with Coach right after this on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. McClellan, single set back to the left of Young. He will roll the pocket himself left side. Cat and mouse stops, spins, gets into the end zone. Touchdown, Alabama. What a play from Bryce Young. This is the Nick Saban Show presented by Alpha Insurance. And for auto, home, and life insurance, call Alpha. Our media guest tonight is Cole Kublik from the SEC Network. One final question from Cole for Coach Nick Saban here at Baumhauer's Victory Grill. All right, Coach, it's been brought to my attention that you're, you're very proud of your quarterback days, that there are some videos floating around, and apparently you were a pretty good quarterback back in the day. Tell us about your most memorable pass when you played quarterback. Well, I've told this story before, but I guess I'll tell it again. You know, when I was a sophomore quarterback, um, you know, Earl Keener was my coach, and he was probably one of the most successful coaches in West Virginia football ever. And we were playing Mason Town Valley. It was the, like, 10th maybe game of the season. And we had lost one game. We lost the first game when we were coming out of Pop Warner as sophomores. So we were, like, 9-1, and one, or I don't even remember how many games we played then. And the team we were playing had the same record. So whoever won this game got in the playoffs. All right, so we go to Masontown Valley. you got to walk through the graveyard from the school to get to the field. The lights are bad. And, you know, in my little town in West Virginia, Mononga, the last guy turned the lights out. Everybody went to the game. I mean, there was nobody left in town. So they're all in Masontown. All right, they used to stand behind the bench and tell me how much money they, how, how many points they gave. All right, <laughs> so we got to cover. you got to score one more time. Did to you cover. even know what that meant I, as a high school yeah, kid? I mean, I was 15 years old, and I called the plays. All right, so we go to Mason Town Valley. We walk through the graveyard. We go out there and play. We get behind 18 to nothing. I mean, we're getting a line and kicked out of our butt. All right, so um, we walk back through the graveyard. We go in the locker room. Coach Keener he never yells or anything, kind of get it straightened out. So we get 18-12. We get the ball back with a minute 25 to go in the game. And I'm, I call the plays. So we go down the field in two minutes. Now we get fourth and 12 at the 25-yard line. He calls the last time out. So I run over to the sidelines, and I'm like, he asked me, he says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, what I think is you should call this play. <laughs> so I, I, I did not want to call this play because everybody in town's there watching. If it doesn't work, it's going to be on me. So he, he said, he used to call me Young Nicky. He says, Young Nicky, he says, I don't care what play you call. You got the fastest guy in the state playing left halfback, and you got the number one receiver in the state, three time All State playing split in. I don't care what play you call, but one of the two of them need to get the ball. Yep. This was my first coaching lesson. That's why I remember it. So I'm walk, run out on the field, and I say, okay, now it's fourth and 12. Why would you call play action pass? But in my simple mind, at 15 years old, I called 26 crossbar pass. That means the left halfback facing, two back facing. Faking in the six hole, X post corner. So I'm going to fake the ball to my one good guy and throw it to the other. Yep. Uh, he caught it for a touchdown. It wasn't a great pass, but he caught it, and we won the game 19 to 18. So that's, that's, my, 
That's my first coaching lesson in the one pass that I remember, but it was the sequence of events that got us there. And uh, then there was a huge fight that broke out after the game because that was pretty typical in those days too. <laughs> Did you win that too? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about the team. I'm talking about the fans. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just want to know, is there any 8 or 16 millimeter film of that somewhere? I, I, I hadn't seen it if there is, but it would be interesting. It, it would be fun. Always fun, Coach, to get the final word from you. The final word from Coach Nick Saban each and every week here on the show is presented by Mercedes-Benz. Coach? Well, you know, I'm going to ask the fans the same thing that I ask the players. Why are we here? You know, why are we here? I mean, we're here to dominate in the SEC, play SEC games, have positive performance when we play SEC games. And we've had three games now to lead up to prepare ourselves to do that. But, you know, we got to create an atmosphere and environment when we're playing at home right, that creates a disadvantage for the other team. That means when they have the ball and they're doing their signals and they're trying to get the snap count and all that kind of stuff, we got to make them go on silent. It's a, it's a huge advantage for the defense when you can do that. So I, 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 I'm hopeful right, that we'll have a great crowd. It's a night game. Um, these guys are better than they have been in the past. Uh, we need the support of the crowd. You're part of the team. All the people who support the team are a part of the team, and I know our players will appreciate it, but uh, we need it. I mean, we need it, and it helps every part of the program. I don't care if it's recruits being here. I don't care who it is. When there's a great atmosphere in that stadium, that's a positive for everybody in the house. So help us out as much as you can. We'll try to do the best we can to stack positive performance. Coach, always appreciate the time. Thank right. you so much, Thank sir. Thank you. Head coach Nick Saban with us, of course. Hey, Coach, and the Nick Saban Show presented by Alpha Insurance. Protect your cars, home, life, and business with Alpha. Get a quote or find a local agent at alphainsurance.com.